Hey guys, and welcome back to episode 6. Luke here again talking about Overledger in my series. And today I thought we would just touch on briefly the uh, the competition in the space and the other projects working on interoperability because obviously it's a big deal. And so without further ado, I'm going to dive straight in. Now, first of all, we need to define what interoperability means. And I've talked about that in other videos, but a lot of people in the crypto space, when they think about interoperability, they're only talking about atomic swaps, which is, uh, which is what they call asset transfer, where, you know, you can swap Bitcoin to Ethereum without having to go through a DEX or without having to go through like, a certain, you know, without going through an exchange process, it kind of, you know, that, there's a whole other different story about that, but that's what people really talk about with interoper interoperability. Now that's not really that important for development. To be honest, I mean, when we're talking about maps and enterprise adoption, that are you know some of these uh, some of these chains like Hyperledger and Corda, you know, the two big ones in enterprise, they don't even have tokens. So, I mean, what they want is they want value transfer and data transfer, as in smart contracts and things like that. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit, and I will link all these articles again. So if you want to look into it feel free to do so. But this is a great one by Gilbert himself, and it's uh, it's called How Overledger Differs from Interoperability Blockchains. Now, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to read the entire thing. I will, I do want to pick out a few things, all right? Now, this is important. Uh, they actually decide to rephrase the question here, and he says, how do we use interoperability to harness the power of blockchains and be the catalyst for maps adoption of blockchain, all right? So if we scroll down, we scroll down here, there's a, they talk about interoperability blockchains. And now that's what most people think about when they think about interoperability. You know, you, your Aon, your Polkadot, One Ledger, Icon, uh, Cosmo, uh, Cosmos is definitely getting a bit of hype at the moment. But he touches on these things here. These blockchains uh, introduce additional complexity, overhead, and technical risk by either, one, introducing another blockchain on top of existing blockchains. You know, you've got your Aons, etc adding another consensus mechanism, which which we'll touch on here in a second, and imposing limitations to connect chain to chain, and um, mandating a fundamental change to an enterprise systems to use their technology. Now, this is actually the biggest one for me, right? Now, let's think about, let's think about, oh, I don't want to hate on Aon, but I'm not really hating, it's just, it's just the truth. Okay, so let's say if you're an enterprise and you want to develop a cross-platform DLT settlement thing, you know, where you're trying to settle with two banks across the world, right? You don't want to have to rewrite your entire system to integrate on Aon, do you? You don't want to have to run your settlement platform on Aon. It just doesn't make sense. You know, the whole point of interoperability here with Overledger is that it removes single vendor lock-in, which means they're not tied to a single vendor, right? So let's say what happens if in five years time, Aon something goes wrong, you know, so now these enterprises have built all their technology and systems, spent millions of dollars and months and months developing on Aon to connect chains, but now Aon isn't working as well as they wanted to, or something else has come along, something better, and now they're stuck, you know, so this one's a big one for me, This I, I love that, that's a big one for me, you know, these are some of the questions uh, that Gilbert references here, you know, how will your protocol be adapted for future blockchains? It's a great one. How we connect to networks and the internet, and how do you use interoperability to tap into the multiple ledger? Now, these are the questions you need to be asking. And again, here he goes, other technologies introduce additional complexity, overhead, and technical risk by introducing another blockchain, another consensus mechanism, and imposing limitations to connect chain to chain. And he talks about them here in this, in this little layer here is where they sit. Now, we'll move over to the white paper because they actually, and I've actually never seen this before, I, you know, obviously I'm sure there are projects that have done it, but in their white paper, they actually have a very detailed comparison with all the big name interoperability projects in the space. And, you know, this table is fantastic here, but also if you scroll down, every single different section of these chains is compared. And so it's a really good, you know, each one of these is compared and it's a really good, um, just a good understanding but I think the main thing to focus on here and this is a really good graph to, to help people understand okay so we you know we have 
one uh, for Interledger, we have one to one chain. So Bitcoin to Ethereum, but with a middle blockchain, right? You know, it's the same thing here. Now, this one is a little bit different. It's a bit similar to Overledger. However, it can only connect Bitcoin to Ethereum between one channel or Ethereum to Aeon, you know, or Ethereum to um, EOS. It can't connect multiple at one time. And that's why Overledger matters because it can connect Bitcoin, Ethereum, Hyperledger, Corda, all to each other at one time. It's not limited to one to one. And you know, here you've got your Cosmos, they've got a middle chain as well, Polkadot, Aeon. Moving on. This is a, uh, this is a, I just, I just want to say this again. This is a really good part of the, the white paper to get a good understanding. But if we move on to this article here, um, is code multi-chain law? It's a really good one, just at a fundamental level to sort of understand consensus, um, you know, the mechanisms between two chains and what that means. And so here there's actually, um, he's used three different types of interoperability between different networks, right? And so the first approach is actually a dominant blockchain will emerge on top of uh, different networks, right? And so this is, he's referencing here the fact that some people believe that their blockchain will be the number one. And so there doesn't really need to be a, um, a need for interoperability. And so for things like this, he's talking about, you know, the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance or Hyperledger Fabric, where, you know, they think, oh, well, you know, if we just keep building on our same infrastructure, you know, it, it'll be the top one, it'll be the best one. Right, and he doesn't think that's going to be very good. This is Paolo Tasca, by the way. He's a um, he's the lead at UCL Blockchain, and he doesn't think that's a very good thing because how are you going to protect yourself against future blockchain enhancements or future networks? And it also it locks people into the same infrastructure as we've been talking about before. You know, it it really just limits enterprises to one vendor, and it's just not healthy. The second option he says is linking two different blockchains via an intermediate blockchain, right? So now, what are some examples of this? And you know, this is one chain, your Cosmos, your Polkadot, your Aeon, right? And so what he means is, if let's say, as, it, as he mentioned here, you know, code in A, code law in A, code law in B, but you have to connect to the blockchain in the middle, and that would have its own consensus mechanisms or its own um, its own requirements to develop upon it and it just again it just doesn't make sense because if you think about it maybe 10 years times who knows what blockchain is going to look like right and so maybe these intermediate chains or bridges are outdated and so they're going to have to update it which means what which means any vendors that have built on this specific bridging chain or hubs are going to have are going to have issues right so if we move on the uh, the third alternative method is using a layer approach uh, which is a which, as we've talked about, is the application level layer, uh, level instead of the transaction level, right? And what this means is, is if we go back up here, I think he's actually got a picture here. Here we go. Is that there isn't no blockchain C in the middle? There, you know, up up here we've got blockchain C, where it introduces different complexities and things like that. But um, if we if we scroll down, this is this is what he's talking about. This is the solution. It doesn't stop. It doesn't introduce another code, you know, the code law or consensus mechanism or any complexity. You can just build here and communicate between here. You see how it's all meshed together? It just works seamlessly. And so I'll link this article as well because it's a really good, it gives some fantastic examples to help you understand. But I do want to, I also just want to jump back to here. I know there's a lot of, a lot of people talking about Unibright as a potential, um, a potential, you know, competition for um for overledger or quant network and i think it's very important to distinguish not only the tech side but also progress development and the team and you know networking connecting i mean most of these guys here are still in development phase you know they're incubator phase you know they're not they're not fully ready you know they're not fully ready to enhance all of this whereas overledger their enterprise version is actually live right now and people are building upon it but I do, as I said, I do want to mention Unibright, and Unibright is a bit more rigid in that they offer frameworks and connectors for people to use. It's either the right tool for the job, or they've got to approach the Unibright consultancy team to develop the right connector for them. Whereas software developers can build exactly the right tool for the job with Overledger. 
Um, approaching Unibrite to do the dev work might always be possible or affordable and Unibrite is more focused on integrating with enterprise resource planning software. So they don't allow you to create a web page for example or create mobile slash desktop apps. With Overledger it's a bit different because there's complex, uh, complete flexibility with the developer and they can you know, build whatever solution they want because the ball is in their court. Now that's obviously very important from a flexibility and development standpoint but also I just don't think the um, the team is quite, you know, the team is definitely fantastic for Unibrite, but as I've mentioned in previous videos, the team and connections with Quant, you know, the networking and um, stuff like that is really what sells this for me, you know, because an idea is one thing, but it's the execution that really carries the project to its full potential. Now, I want to move on to Hyperledger Quilt, because people often raise this to me, they go, ah. Oh, look, what's Hyperledger Quilt, you know, because why won't the big boys just build their own interoperability? And sure, it's an excellent point, and other people are starting to come into the space a little bit, but not only will they be lagging, but perhaps their tool may not be as simple or as, um, as flexible. And Hyperledger Quilt have tried this, you know, they had a, um, they wanted to introduce something that obviously interoperability between ledger systems, right? But I had a look at the, uh, the chat rooms, and Quilt has actually been, it's been dying off. As you can see, it was in the incubation phase and they could only really achieve um, atomic swaps as we mentioned before, not treaty contracts. And so treaty contracts are where you've got uh, smart contracts that can be written on multiple chains to communicate, which is obviously a massive, massive deal for um, en enterprise maps and adoption. But uh, more importantly, Overledger is actually introducing smart contracts on Bitcoin that communicate with Ethereum, which is going to be very cool to see. But people always bring up Hyperledger quilt to me. Now I do, I want to mention something, this is just, this is just pretty funny to me, it's pretty related. Uh, Overledger, or Quant, sorry, actually joined Hyperledger Foundation a few days ago. If we just scroll down here, here we go, we are, you know, obviously among with some big names here, Ripple, Samsung, PwC, R3, but it means that they're part of the, the consortium as well, or the foundation to help collaborate, but more importantly, check out this tweet. A day after joining, we had the team from Hyperledger in our office this morning. We're looking forward to collaborating on Hyperledger Quilt and how Overledger can help bring interoperability, right? So it sounds like to me that their solution was lacking a little bit and it's, it's very encouraging to see um, Quant being brought on board here and their expertise and checking out their solution. I think, that's, I think that screams a big, um, you know, a big sign of credibility in the space. I mean, it's pretty big. The Hyperledger ecosystem is probably the, the biggest enterprise ecosystem for blockchain that I know of. And so to have these guys, the day after joining the foundation in their office, talking to the Quant guys about their project, it's, it's a big deal. Now, one more point I want to touch on before, before, um, before we finish up. And I, I do want to say that uh, this video is quite brief. It's, it really only touches on the basics of the... Um, the differences between different projects and things like that. If you want me to go into a deep tech dive between every single um, solution like Cosmos comparison or an Aeon comparison, I'm definitely looking at doing that in the future but obviously that's going to take a lot of work and a lot of time but let me know in the comments if you want something like that. But um, <clears throat> obviously, um, I want to touch on this one aspect. In the crypto space, people in interoperability care about Bitcoin and Ethereum being connected or Bitcoin and EOS, which is obviously a big deal for these public um, permissionless blockchains to be connected. And Quant's already done that. You know, you've got your Bitcoins, your Ethereums. They've already done that, right? But more importantly, Quant has connected, you know, Hyperledger, Quorum, Corda, um, Alastra. I think, you know, they've also obviously IOTA and Ripple and things like that as well. But those ones are enterprise chains. And I haven't seen anyone connect enterprise chains. And now you may ask me, look, why is that important? And it's important because the big enterprise guys are already experimenting with DLT, as I'm going to move over here. They're already experimenting with DLT. And they're not using EOS. They're not really using, you know, Cardano. They're using permission blockchains like Corda or, um, or Hyperledger Fabric, right? That's what they're using. They're using that plat platform for the basics. So, Cosmos isn't really a solution for these guys, is it? 
because they're not connecting Hyperledger or Quarter yet, or Aeon isn't a solution for these big enterprise guys because they're not interconnecting enterprise blockchains. And I think for me, that is the biggest deal because Overledger is not only targeting the crypto community and the crypto development space, but also the enterprise space, which is obviously their main business target. You know, that's their main um, target audience. So I want to expand on this, this idea of inter-blockchain communication in enterprise real quick, just to touch on that last point I mentioned. People often ask me, but like, why do enterprise need to have interoperability. Now, I'm just going to reference Marco Polo and WeTrade here. Now, Marco Polo is a trade finance platform built on blockchain and it's built on Quarter, which is written by R3, right? And obviously, they have a, um, there's some really exciting things here, and they've got some big banks involved, right? But then you've also got WeTrade, right? And here are the banking partners of WeTrade, you know, some familiar names here if you're familiar with Quant, with, you know, Unicredit, HSBs, etc. I'm not going to touch on that now, but these platforms are very similar, but what's the difference? The difference is they're in isolation. You know, this one's written on Quarter. This one's written on Hyperledger. These guys can't communicate. So basically what we're going from is we're going from banks being not using DLT at all and being completely separated to now banks using isolated groups or isolated platforms of blockchain, right? Which is fine. You know, that's great. And it also would be fine if every single person in the world used the one blockchain, but it's just not going to happen. You know, in five to 10 years time, what if someone comes out with the, the next best finance blockchain and everyone wants to shift to that? So what you need, and what I've come to realize over the past month is Overledger isn't specifically targeting, you know, one business to one business, but their scope is actually into platform connection right, into platform connection. And now you might be thinking, oh, Luke, God, what are you talking about? So Marco Polo is a trade finance platform. We trade for, uh, we trade is a, uh, a finance platform, which is basically into bank connections. Now also, if actually I will bring up uh, IIN here by um, JP Morgan real quick, because this is another one where are we? This is another one that's the same thing, right? Now, these three are all built on separate DLTs. Um, Interbank Information Network is actually expand, is, um, is built on uh, Quorum, obviously. But these guys are all built on separate things. And so, Overledger is the glue that will be able to connect all of these platforms, which is huge in my opinion, because we're not just talking about crypto kitties can now communicate with EOS gambling dApp. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something on a much larger scope. And so that's why I think Overledger compared to, oh God, I've got to scroll back down, compared to the rest of these ones, are really just, it's in a whole nother league, okay? I just want you to understand that, you know, Quant isn't just targeting the crypto space. You know, it's, it's really elevated at a whole nother level. Anyway, guys, I appreciate you watching this video. I dragged on a little bit. It probably got a little bit muddly in there. Let me know in the comments if you've got any questions. Obviously, all these links here, really good links. I will post them in the comments in the description so you guys can have a look. Um, let me know if you want to have a look at, if you want me to do a deep dive uh, tech discussion on these individually. It, it's going to take me a lot of time, but I'm, I'm happy to look into it if you guys really think it's a big issue. Um, I also just want to say thanks to, you know, Sonic, Ghost, Sec, some of the guys in the Telegram channels have been really helping out just with a, a bit of a basic understanding of the, the tech and things like that. So I really appreciate that, guys, and uh, thanks for watching. Uh, stay tuned for Episode 7, I suppose. Thank you.